In this video, uh, we're going to continue our conversation about logic uh, design and uh, digital logic in general. Um, so, so far we have had many videos in the past where we cover various aspects of Boolean algebra, using Boolean algebra to design functions. And in this, in here, we want to just do a quick review. All of Boolean algebra is based on having switches that you can change their value. So we wanted to go back, take a minute, and review the switch, electrical switch type. Of course, there are all kinds of mechanical switches, but we're focused on the electrical switch types. And really, the very first one we have on our uh, list here is uh, electromagnetic. Um, and it's a relatively simple, useful device where you've got a spring here, and you've got a metal piece, and these two contacts are separated from each other, when this, this is magnetized, this is a, 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 you have a winding around the piece of metal, so when you send electricity through the winding, it gets magnetized and it sucks down this metal. This attracts the metal down in this direction. And when the metal comes down in that direction, it makes a contact here and it closes. When there's no energy in that, when it releases, that's why this, they call all of these normally open switches. So this is a relay, electromagnetic relay, whatever you want to call it. Now that's very was very useful, and it's still pretty useful if you need to pass a lot of power through. But uh, all the computer systems and the electronics we have today are really kind of got started by uh, using this transistor, which could be built in a very very small uh, dimension, and uh, it was very good. But as the time went by, we needed to have um, uh, faster switching, lower power in some cases, in some cases be able to uh, switch a lot of power, a lot of current. Um, the MOSFET, the metal oxide semiconductor became famous. So these are really little, two different kind of switches if you want that use transistor. And these are this this particular one, the MOSFET, especially the field effect, trans, the called field, sometimes called field effect transistors. Is really the workhorse of the industry switch uh, used for switching in the industry. Of course, this these these grouping. The first grouping I have is normally or normally open. You could also have a normally closed. As you can see, the configuration are slightly changed. Where now this 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 connection is under here. The spring is pulling it up and is making contact. So when we when you magnetize this uh, this device here, then it's going to pull that metal down. And it's going to open up the connection. So if you don't have power to it, it's normally open. And then this is an N. That was an N MOS. This is a P MOS, kind of an opposite, of course, normally closed. And then it opens up. And then we have the um, this one, which uh, is the if you want to think about it, is the opposite of uh, the NPN. NPN was the uh, normally open, and the PNP is normally closed. Great. So, so these are the switches. Switches are the fundamentals of Boolean algebra. Boolean algebra is built on switches, so that's why we want to go back and cover this. Now, in the past, let me see if I can find it. In the past, uh, there have been two ways of building logic based on switches. One has been what they call a forward logic, and they were looking to see if, if this side, le uh, this left, let's call this one left, this side right, if the left and right are not connected to each other, then we call that a zero. If they're connected to each other, then we call that a one. And this technology, this type of switching circuit, we don't use it very much. In, we don't use it in computers at all. But it, it was one of the first ways people um, were using switches to create logic. In this case, it's normally open. And if you apply energy to these two switches, you can close it. Okay, so that's what in in our computer system we use the regenerative logic switching, which is this one, and most of our gates kind of use this philosophy to build it. Each one of the switches are transistors. In this case, we have normally open, which is either we are using an NPN or we will using an NMOS to build it. <laughs> so normally open means based, so what we're gonna do is if no power is applied, these are open, which means we're connected here and we're not getting any power going over there. And then as we want to power this one, we'll close this 
and close this. This is an AND gate because this has to close, this has to close because we, before we deliver power to our output F. Okay, so these are, and again, this is kind of the basis of computers today. This was what we will use earlier. Okay, so now that we know how switches is used to build gates, the next thing we want to make sure we cover, I covered here, is that one is, uh, in the previous videos, we've always used this to represent gates. And that's great. This, this, the name of this is IEEE, is the organization that creates uh, standards as well as IEC. And this is the, I typically call this the distinctive uh, shape, distinctive graphics. You can do that for simple gates and people can look at that thing and automatically know that you got an AND gate. The non-distinctive um, graphics simple, sometimes people, you know, it's easier if you just draw a box and inside the box indicate what you got. And both of those are fine. Uh, the labeling is important. Make sure that your pins are outside the device and up above the line that they are connected to. So, so this gives you kind of a uh, pr overview of that, except this, I just showing it for an AND gate. You can do the same thing for OR, NOT, and all of those, you simply do a box. And as we get farther and farther and we're talking about more complex devices, they do, they simply do not have a shape, distinctive shape that could be used. So most of those will be designed as a box with a number and inside the box, you basically indicate what type of product is it that you have there, okay? And this is an interesting concept for us to spend a little bit of time talking about, which is if I were to have a two input device, if I have a device that has two input, how many possible functions can I build? And the answer to that question is I can, it's a binary and to be two input, um, uh, 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 two inputs, I'm going to have four possible cases, and those four possible cases can be combined 16 different ways. So this is more or less the equation I use to figure out how many possible cases I can have. And so in this case, I can have 16 different functions. Some of them are trivial. For example, this one is pretty trivial. F0 is always zero, or up here F7 is always, uh, always uh, VCC. Some of the ones we have dealt with when, for example, when the output is F7, in other words, the seventh pos eight possibility, 0, 1, 1, 1, that's an OR we know, that's an AND, and you can look to see if you see exclusive OR, if, if you see any of the NOR, NAND, and all the others, and I'm sure you can find them in here. This table basically tells you how many possible functions can you create with two inputs, okay? And uh, of course, with the three, you can kind of extend this for the three, four, and five, if you're interested. All right, so now we've talked about this. A lot of the gates, so far we've been pretty much using mostly gates, so it's probably time for us to talk about physical packaging. Now, up uh, it, it initially when the computers got started and the integrated circuits came about, everything was designed in dual inline package or DIP. Now, the dual inline package has a pin that comes this way and a pin that comes that way, and then these two rows of pins can be any of these things could have anywhere from uh, 14 pins, seven on each side, which or they can like this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This one is a 16 pin. You can have a 20 pin. You can have a 40 pin. I think the largest I've seen is 64 pin dual in line. The way this works, the PC board has holes in it. These pins go through the hole and you solder them. Um, these are great. We use them for prototyping in the classroom environment, but in practice, it's very rare to see them used in production just because um, wave soldering, which is a technique used to solder these to the board, is very hard to maintain and to have a good uh, process. The other thing is that when you make your PC board, you have to drill holes and then plate the holes and all of that. So it's a, it's a somewhat difficult things to do what's called a through hole device through hole meaning goes through your board so uh, about probably 30 30 years or a little over 30 40 years ago probably this idea of a surface mount came along instead of having hole if this is your pc board instead of having holes that go through your board and then you solder into it what they decided to do if this is your board the chip sits right on top of it and typically gets just basically placed it just, it, there's a solder on the solder paste. It's kind of like a gooey little pay, um, 
uh, material which has solder in it, it is put on the trace and then the chip is put on top of it. And instead of having to solder it uh, physically, either through a wave machine or some other mechanism, all they do, they heat the device and the PC board and the solder paste that was on the traces melts and connects the two together. And this is, this is by far um, the, the most common way uh, integrated circuits are delivered this day by far, by far. And um, the most common packages I've seen is called SOIC and SSOP, a small uh, shrink, small outline package, and a small outline integrated circuit. If you, if you ever look around, you will see there are hundreds of different packages, but these, these two are one, two of the most common, but of course, DIP is pretty much, dual inline package is pretty much going out of style, except for very, very special cases of small run prototyping, or when you need maybe a lot of power consumptions or something like that. Most of the time you go to these smaller devices. One thing to note though, that is, the pins, these pins, for example, from here to here, typically these are a tenth of an inch, or another way to say is two and a half millimeters. Okay, that might sound small. That might sound small to you until you start looking about how far these pins. These pins could be as as close as two millimeters distance, center to center, which is like the ten times smaller than that. Trying to solder, I mean, we can't, in a pinch, you can solder this thing to a board, but you better be really, really good at soldering with lots of practice, a steady hand, and lots of patience, and lots of good uh, cleaning um, tools. So, but, but this is more or less what manufacturers do, because with automation and robots and precision placement, you can place millions of these things at, uh, even in a day, where this would be really tough to get to those volumes of even a thousand or ten thousand. You need extensive, extensive infrastructure to make those happen. This is much, much easier with automation to get there. Okay. There are other ones. If you have a very, very large device, then sometimes we go with pin, especially if you need the heat to dissipate, pin grid array. Sometimes it's also called better nails. And so what happens is that the bottom of the bottom of the chip has uh, has pins coming out of it much like shown here and you could literally have all of the bottom filled with pins typically this is used for much larger number of inputs and outputs where these where these devices may have you know anywhere from a few pins to maybe 100 pin or so uh, this one is clearly for stuff that has a lot more pin, 300 pin, 200 pin, 600 pin, not 600, I haven't seen 600, but three, 400 pins at least. Uh, 100, 150, is, is, they would go to these, and um, that's how they do it. Okay, so these are the most common packages. Are these the only one? No, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of packages, and typically when you get the data sheet, at the end of the data sheet, they may offer you multiple packages depending on what your need is you can order one package or another package so th this brings us to the end of a kind of a, a more or less a um, smorgasbord of different topic which we needed to kind of do a presentation to you at this point uh, basically talked about switches different kind of electrical switches we talked briefly about different logic the uh, pass-through logic or the regenerative logic and how they work. Uh, a little brief discussion of uh, you have a choice of using shape distinctive graphic for your stuff or just use a non-shape distinction, basically use a box and number it and inside the box say what kind of a device you have. We chatted about if you got two input, how many possible different functions can you create? And then some conversation about packages and mainly the main message is that DIP is mostly for prototyping, a small, small quantity work, and for major, larger quantity and um, manufacturing surface mount. Is surface mount is the common one to go. A couple of pack, common packages are SSOP and SSOIP. As we mentioned, as I mentioned just briefly, the ratio of the pin distance and sizing is one to ten between these two type of devices. Could be less, but 
a ratio of 1 to 10 is pretty common. And of course, if you got a really, really large number of input, output, and pins that you need, then pin grid uh, or is probably the best approach to it.